This is a book which is uh, not just about Washington, uh, not just about a single Washington law firm, but about, it's sort of the culmination of everything that I had learned from writing about lawyers and law firms uh, back, uh, back in the day. And that when you're a newspaper reporter, you learn early on that underneath every decision and behind every, almost behind every election and every political thing that happens from the smallest town to the biggest city, uh, nobody does anything in this country anymore without uh, consulting a lawyer. Uh, I'd started my uh, journalistic career as a reporter in Greenville, Mississippi. And uh, from there, I went on to the Tampa Tribune. And after living in, uh, t in Florida for five years, I had decided that uh, the, only, the only place that I could possibly live that would be better than Florida, because I kind of liked warm weather, was California. And I ended up getting a job at a legal paper out there called the Los Angeles Daily Journal, uh, which was owned by, uh, I'm not even sure, looking back on it, if I recall, if I really remembered at the time that it was a, uh, a, a strictly a legal paper. It sort of looked like the Wall Street Journal. And it was owned by Charlie Munger, who had a firm out there, Munger Tolls. And uh, he's the Charlie Munger, who's the associate of, uh, of Warren Buffett now. And uh, I just, uh, I, I, I had loved covering courts. When I was a kid, you know, I, my father, um, I'm sure this wasn't intentional, he kept giving me books about lawyers to read. So I had read all the books, of uh, Clarence Darrow's autobiography, and I remember one of the books that I had loved the most when I was little was uh, Louis Neiser's My Life in Court. And I actually got to interview Louis Neiser uh, when I was a reporter in California, which was one of the uh, sort of the thrills of my life. Uh, and from there, I ended up going to American, they, after writing uh, a couple of stories uh, about sort of internal law, law firm uh, problems. Uh, one of them, the big story was about uh, a crisis they were having at Morrison and Forster. I ended up getting a job, offered a job at American Lawyer Magazine, which ultimately led to my writing uh, covering the demise of Finley Cumble and writing my first book, uh, Shark Tank. And it was while I was at Legal Times that I, uh, I had an idea for uh, writing a, uh, a story about one of the lawyers at Williams and Connolly who I thought would have had the, the greatest dream job in the history of law, which was uh, running a baseball team. Uh, and that was Larry Lacchino, who uh, I went over to his office, and he was the president of the uh, Baltimore Orioles. And Larry, uh, I got almost all through the whole story to the end of the story. And uh, then somebody I was interviewing about Larry said, oh, I guess you know about his illness. And I went, oh, yeah, sure, right, yeah, the illness, uh, well, it's terrible. And so, anyway, I began to piece together the story of how, at the age of 39 years old, Larry had been stricken with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, had an, uh, was the 36th person in the history of medicine to have an autologous bone transplant. And while he was in, and while he was in recovery, uh, a mira his miraculous recovery from this illness, uh, he uh, uh, the, he had the, the he, he went to the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and they piped in the Boston Red Sox games, and so ultimately uh, Larry, when Larry got out of his isolation, the, they said, "What's the one favor that uh, what, what's the one thing that you most want to do now that you're getting out of the hospital?" And Larry said, "I want to go walk around Fenway Park." And here's Fenway Park right here, by the way. Here's a picture of uh, old Fenway Park. Well, Larry's story is always, uh, I've always thought it was one of the most dramatic and wonderful stories because, of course, Larry, 20, uh, 13, 23 years later, Larry uh, not only uh, survived what, against all the odds, but managed uh, an even greater, beat the odds in even a greater way by, by being the uh, leader of the Red Sox when they won the World Series, a feat that nobody thought was possible. Uh, it was shortly after meeting Larry and, uh, and, and uh, telling his story in legal times that I signed on to cover the Iran-Contra hearings. And that was when I first encountered Brendan Sullivan sitting a few seats behind him in the, uh, in the press row in the Senate while he was representing uh, Ali North. And when Brendan Sullivan uh, came in to uh, represent you, the room, the room would crackle. It still crackles. When I walked into the Ted Stevens case uh, trial, uh, this year, you know, 
uh, there's, there's an electricity in the room that you're, you're present with uh, some of the great lawyers. As a reporter, I've been pretty lucky to uh, be able to be in, in uh, trials with people like Melvin Belli and uh, William Kunstler. And uh, I was going to mention uh, I'm Jim Coleman, who used to be at, at Wilmer Cutler and now is, I think, down at Duke University, when he represented uh, Ted Bundy in the, uh, some of his death penalty appeals. Uh, when you're in the presence of these great lawyers, uh, it's really a spectacular uh, feeling. Uh, you know, I don't. Some of you may have heard. Uh, I don't know if some of you are watching Boardwalk Empire. Uh, anybody see the last episode where the uh, uh, the uh, Arnold Rothstein, the uh, guy who fixed the uh, 1919 World Series, is is preparing his uh, legal defense, and one of the characters in the program says. Uh, Arnold, you should be a lawyer. And he replies without sort of missing a beat. He says, I'm, no, I'd rather continue to make my living honestly. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, lawyers in this country that uh, sort of uh, don't, don't necessarily all shower uh, praise on the uh, legal profession. But fortunately, I've been able to be around some of the uh, best and the greatest. And when I used to do my 50 best uh, lawyer story for... A Washingtonian every year, it would occur to me that beyond, and I would list three, usually I would sort of limit it to three, um, and Brendan would be on there, and David Kendall, who's right over here, would be on there, and, and then sometimes I would rotate the third spot, Richard Cooper, I think, was on there one year, and Bob Barnett was on there one year, uh, and I was thinking, boy, I could put like ten, Williams and Connolly has about, there's at least ten, and, and Brendan and David would probably say all 50, but, you know. Uh, so I'd always thought that the story of Williams and Connolly would make, a, would make a, a, a great book. And a few years ago at Washingtonian, I did a piece called The Firm That Runs the World, in which I talked about a lot of the uh, sort of concentric circles and uh, some might say conflicts uh, that sort of enveloped this uh, legendary firm. For example, they represented the tobacco industry in the Supreme Court cases involving whether or not tobacco should be treated as a drug by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, but they also represent the Vince Lombardi Cancer Institute. And uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite ones in involved uh, Bob Barnett, who uh, he, the, when, Dave, when this week with David Brinkley used to be on every Sunday morning, and it struck me that Williams and Connolly represented the network that broadcast the show, ABC. They represented uh, all, all of the talent uh, that was on the show, uh, George Will, uh, Brinkley, Koki Roberts, Sam Donaldson. Most of the time, they would also represent the talent that was on the show, James Carville and Mary Madeline, for example. And then to sort of cap it all off, they were also the attorneys for Archer Daniels Midland, uh, which for many years. And... Uh, uh, part of which is uh, retold in the uh, movie The Informant with Matt Damon, uh, Aubrey Daniels' role. Anyway, uh, as I looked at Brendan Sullivan's career over the, the entirety of his 35 years, I used to always say in my articles about him, and when I was talking to people, I would say, Brendan Sullivan has gone 35 years and has never had one client uh, serve any time in jail which was pretty remarkable because by the time people came to him, they were usually pretty far up the creek. It wasn't like he was defending, uh, you know, uh, too many uh, Roman Catholic nuns or that sort of thing. And, and after a while, I began to wonder if it was really true. Uh, was I just saying this? Was I just sort of, had I just repeated this story so many times that I believed it or not? And so one of the things that I tried to do in this book was to go back and talk a little bit about why Brendan Sullivan has this passion that he has and what the pattern is from when he first came to Williams and Connolly uh, after being uh, uh, defending uh, prisoners at the uh, Presidio uh, Stockade in San Francisco and then on to the, uh, his first cases when uh, prosecutors uh, sort of routinely, he discovered that prosecutors didn't always behave in the most uh, correct manner uh, possible. And uh, I, uh, I, I sort of came to realize, and I think I explained in the book, 
why he is the way he is, why his cases turn out the way they do. 